I mean, I know the one of the models you like um, when we're thinking developmentally is uh, the one by Pam Levin, and uh, which I think is the stages of being. Is it? I can't remember the title. I just call it Ages and Stages, but yeah, it's from. I've got a book somewhere. Um, is it yeah. the Cycles of Power? That's it. The Cycles of Power. Yeah, and it takes you through um, the developmental sequences. That yeah children go through and the developmental tasks they have at a psychological level and behavioral level uh through the different you know cycles of development or cycles of power as she calls them yeah and i think it's a very useful way of thinking we demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations this is the therapy show behind closed doors podcast with bob cook and jackie jones welcome to episode 86 bob we're on 86 and we're rattling towards 100 of the therapy show behind closed doors with myself jackie jones and the ever present mr bob cook hello (laughs) hello you're always in the moment you're ever present Ever present. So the title is it, the How title to Work is, With Our Younger Self, is it? It is. How to Work With Our Younger Self in the Therapy Room. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, what we're talking about is how to work developmentally. Yeah. So it means that therapists who think this way need to have a developmental model. Or at least to have an understanding of uh, developmental theory. And what would be really good as well is if they had an understanding of child uh, theory or therapy, you know, like a child therapy model, if you like. Yeah. Because um, when we're working developmentally, one of the sort of cornerstones really is that Events, traumas, current day processes, stress, depression, anxiety in the present may well trigger off what actually occurred many, many, many years ago. Yeah. And that's really important that we know that. Mm -hmm. So when you say developmentally, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the ages and stages type thing? Yes. Yeah. So... So, for example, if you were going to do, see a CBT therapist, for example, and that's yeah. the favoured model of the NHS, I think largely because of economic reasons, though it's often claimed CBT has a lot of research behind it, um, which is true, but many of the other models now are catching up with the research. Transaction analysis, for example, um, has a lot of research behind it now. Yeah. But, uh, if you went to see CBT therapist, uh, if you could actually get in to see one with a huge waiting list on the NHS, um, they would not be thinking developmentally at all. They would be doing therapy in the here and now and helping people uh, change their thinking patterns and their behavioural processes from the change in the thinking patterns. They wouldn't be interested or they wouldn't go back at all to a person's history and they wouldn't be thinking developmentally. Yeah. They wouldn't be concerned at all in the younger self. Which is a shame because, yeah, totally. Because I I think, you know, if we're, you know, being trained in transactional analysis and looking at the script stuff and everything, there are kind of benchmarks along the way while we're growing up. Mm, mm. And And that's really true. So... In psychodynamic theory or cognitive or analytical theory um, or any of the developmental models in a way, they always they do take that view you've just say, said about the benchmarks um, and the developmental periods yeah. or sequences, if you like, of um, a child developing through teenage years, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I know that you, one of the models you like um, when we're thinking developmentally 
is uh, the one by Pam Levin, and uh, which I think is the Stages of Being. Is it? I can't remember the title. I just call it Ages and Stages. But yeah, it's from. I've got a book somewhere. Um, is it yeah. the Cycles of Power? That's it. The Cycles of Power. Yeah. And it takes you through um, the developmental sequences that yeah. children go through and the developmental tasks they have at a psychological level and behavioural level uh, through the different you know, cycles of development or cycles of power, as she calls them. Yeah. And I think it's a very useful way of thinking. I do. It, it, I like it because it's got structure, and you know me, um, structure, Bob, I like a structure. Um, but I first found this, I think, when I was um, doing my fostering, and it gave me hope because... You know, it kind of goes from the moment we're born to 18, but then we recycle it all through our life. And that kind of made me think, well, if there are ruptures or breakdowns in the relationship, then we have the possibility to rebuild them and, you know, reprocess it further down the line, which I love that. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when I say develop developmentally, I mean, uh, going back to these developmental stages that a child will go through, and also um, going back developmentally often to the stage where um, the real traumas happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the other way that I look at it as well is, you know, if we start a new job, we go back to the very beginning of the kind of the being stage because we don't know anything and it's all new and we're out of our depth. So we look to others you know, to, to provide us certain things. So we're constantly recycling these stages throughout our life, dependent on what we're doing at the time. Oh, oh, absolutely correct. That's the way I think of it as well. Yeah. Um, I don't particularly use that model so much, but it's a model of child development I like, and especially one which is used in, you know, TA theory. I mean, there's many from Eric Erickson's ideas of the seven stages of man, um, we could look at many of Winnicott's ideas of child development. We could look at Freud's ideas of development. We could we could look at many developmental models. Would you say uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need fits into this yeah, as well? That, yeah, that's yeah, one as well, completely. Uh, very much so in terms of yeah. developmental tasks. Yeah, that a person will go through through their lives, um, and uh, it's very very useful because what we find time and time again is then when someone comes into your treatment room and deals with say anxiety say they're overwhelmed with anxiety in a classroom or something as a teacher or a uh, social anxiety or whatever it is um it's usually a trigger back to a different developmental age yeah when they um started to have these anxious uh processes or these depression processes or whatever it is yeah. um and it's really important to think about um, what age a person will go to or get triggered back to uh, when you're working with them. So, yeah. for example, somebody who's triggered back to, say, a trauma or a relational need that wasn't met or a deficit in their childhood, but then you need to know how to work with them at that age they've actually gone back to. And the term I'm going to use is regress to, yeah. going back to. Um, because you'll be dealing with the 12-year-old or the 14-year-old psychologically, even, of course, they might be 30 or 40-year-old physically in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see that regression sometimes just by the body language and the way that they sit or move or, the, you know, the voice, everything. Yeah. So their younger self um, is very evident. Yeah. But the really important question is, what age is this younger self. Yeah. They could regress back to three, regress back to six, regress back to 12. What younger, you know, what's the age of the younger self? And that's very important because that then will determine how you, how you transact therapeutically and how you think therapeutically. Yeah. So what are the signs that as a, a therapist you can use to, to work out what age they are? Would you ask them outright? What age, you know, where have you gone back to? Where are you now? I nearly always do. Okay. And then they will answer. Yeah. It doesn't mean 
that's necessarily correct, but it's a, it's a very good gauge. It's a start, yeah, yeah. And the other thing after asking them um, is things like what you said a moment ago, uh, body posture. Yeah. Nonverbal signals. Because nonverbal, that means that they're quite young. If, you know, they haven't got the power of speech or they can't put things into words, it's all feeling, then they're probably quite young, yeah. That's right. The length of their transactions. Yeah. Uh, the the way they see the world. Um, so, uh, and of course, the analysis of their transactions. But, you know, I think probably the non-verbal uh, signals um, and the way they speak will probably give you the clues to what age we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, because as long as we've got a sort of a ballpark figure, then we know what Absolutely. we're working with and how we need to be around them. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's based on the theory, of course, which is really, really important, is that the decisions we make at these young, you know, younger ages are, you know, our younger self, for example, uh, determine how we are today with our older self. Yeah. And there's many, many... Many, many examples I, I, I could give. Have you ever watched the film um, Notting Hill? Yes. With uh, that uh, that famous actress, which I quite like, and then I'm losing their names. Julia uh, Roberts is the actress, yes, but I can't happened. think for the she life of me what the fellow was. The aristocratic about. sort of woman, a bloke, is it Hugh something, brother? Yes, I... it is, Hugh Grant, that's it. Well done, we got there in the end, Bob. <laughs> something like that. And, and I really like the, 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 the scene where the leading actor is the uh, managing a bookshop. Yeah. And uh, Julie Roberts is this famous sort of actress who, who, who turns up at the bookshop and uh, says to the leading actor, I think it is Hugh Grant. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I, I'm just a young girl, though I'm coming here talking yeah. about X. I'm really a young girl talking to, uh, so, yeah, I can't remember the phases, but basically yeah. in front of you. I get, young, yeah, young I get girl. what you mean, yeah. So they bring their, the idea is we bring our younger selves with us and psychologically in the moment, we may regress back to how, you know, she felt, felt yeah. just younger, you know, girl in front of her first boyfriend. Yes, yeah. Where we fumble over our words and we feel really insecure and nervous yeah. and everything, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So we bring our younger self. We all know that when we go to interviews, for example, you go to an interview for a job or something that's really important to you and you're being evaluated, let's put it that way, um, most people will regret will regress back to a younger age where they feel under pressure or the fear of being judged or the fear of being a failure. I and, do that quite often when I'm with, with somebody of a higher status than me. Very common. Yeah. A, a police Go officer back. or anything. I you know, yeah, I, I instantly regress. Going through customs at the airport. <laughs> so if somebody comes say with those sorts of issues around, you know, feeling very young when they go to interviews or or feeling young when they're stressed or, or whatever. Let's take the interview one, and I do this a lot. The therapy that I, you know, that I might well uh, do, for example, or undertake, probably a better word, is get them to empower themselves and in TA terms, be the age they are, or if we could even put adult, yeah, TA terms. Um, so I might ask them to imagine that the evaluators or interviewers have short skirts on, or have short trousers on, or you know, so they 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 can take the power in the power dynamics. Yeah, they don't feel a child anymore; they feel more grounded. Yes. Yeah. And move from that, what I'll say, younger self or child ego state, if you can TA terms, into a more 
uh, here and now adult place. Yeah. And, and it is really parent. powerful when we can do that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. When we can shift them from one ego state to another, particularly if it's bringing up, you know, memories that they don't particularly like or things, you know, the grounding method I find quite useful in the therapy room. Yes. And of course, we must remember that they're the people that have to change their ego states. So in other words, you can teach them these things and they have to be the people who actually do the change, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. Um, but I think the concept is very useful uh, for them to think about. And that is that they uh, have gone to a younger part of themselves. Yeah. And enable them to be able to be grounded and to function appropriately in the here and now. They need to ground themselves and to act and feel and think as a grown up or adult in TA terms, rather than that regressed teenage yeah. child or whatever you want to put on it. Yeah. And in the therapy room, it's a safe space for people to experiment and explore doing that so that it's a skill that they can then take away and use with them whenever they want to. If they can visualise, you know, certain things around them that are going to ground them or make them feel more empowered, then that's a fantastic life skill to have. Yeah, and I, I remember when in another lifetime when I was a teacher uh, stroke lecturer and um, I taught at in the different colleges I think of one college in particular and the problems I was having in I was very I was quite young um, teaching these rebellious 16 year olds and 17 year olds lovely age but the, but the problem was I was younger than them <laughs> psychologically in reality yeah and I needed to set boundaries and be a parent or an adult, yeah. not a sort of fumbling 12-year-old. And I didn't know TA at all. So, you know, what I'm talking about now in hindsight is a wonderful thing. But if I hadn't known it, I would have um, either not taken a job in the first place to be a teacher in a technical college. Um, or I would perhaps have learned how to um, have techniques to yeah. take care of my younger self and ground myself. Yeah. I mean, what I did in the end was realise it wasn't a job for me and left. Now, I'm not saying anybody listening to this goes and leaves their job, but what I am saying is that I think it's just important to have a model to think this way and to help clients do what exactly what you've just talked about ground themselves and move to an yeah. adult ego state and uh, find ways to empower themselves and to, to start to be aware that we do shift you know from moment to moment where we are and dependent on who we're having a transaction with or what situation mm -hmm. we're in we will be at different psychological ages it's it's understandable but it's being aware of when we shifted and when we're in a different state absolutely correct and, you know, you and I trained in transaction analysis and the originator of transaction analysis, Eric Byrne, uh, he died a long time ago now. And we're talking about a model that was created 80 years ago. Yeah. And in his first book called Transaction Analysis Psychotherapy, I think it was 1961, when he's talking about what you're talking about here and I'm talking about here, um, the ideas that will move from different parts of ourselves, he, he was talking, he gave an example, I think, about a client who came in uh, to see him and said, oh, I feel like a three-year-old in my parents' study. Yeah. As an example of a shift to our younger self in the uh, shadow of an authoritarian figure, authoritarian figure. Yeah. Or a perceived authoritarian figure. Yeah. I think what we're talking about here is extraordinarily common. I mean, you just talked about it earlier on, where you said that with authoritarian people like, going through the customs or... Definitely, yeah. You can feel part of your younger self uh, coming forward. And, and I think that's why I like Pam Levin's Ages of Stages, because at each one of the stages, like there's one that's three... I think it, I'm, I'm just checking here what age it is. 18 months yeah. to three years and then three to six. For me, that age three to six is a really important one as mm -hmm. we're growing up because we're, we're kind of moving away from 
our parents, you know, we're starting going to school, we're in, you know, the first year of school, there's an awful lot of transitions taking place within that three year period. Mm -hmm. That's right. And there's different developmental tasks. Yeah. And if there's a rupture or trauma well, uh, in those years, so we don't actually, I don't know, complete those developmental yeah. tasks, uh, then we're always attempting to complete them throughout life. That's it, yeah. And that it's age between really. three and six, you know, it's all around separating fantasy from reality and, you know, working out who we are as a person. So it, it's a really important developmental process that we go through. And mm. if there are ruptures in it or if we don't, you know, get our needs met in the right way by our caregivers, then it does have an impact on us. Mm. I mean, Margaret Marler, another famous child, development this she talked about um that period as a separation individuation period ah uh, i love that as well yeah and if there's problems in that period like say um you sh this is your area uh people uh being fostered or yeah. losing important people in their lives or attachment ruptures um they, they will have that will have severe or can have severe consequences psychologically throughout their life. Yeah. And, um, they may always carry that deficit. Yeah. And it, it's not it's not just, you know, children in the care system and everything. There's been an awful lot of studies, I can't, you know, quote anybody, around, you know, kids that go into boarding school from a young age and how that can impact on them as well, as far as the individuation and separation part of things. And, you know, I know we've spoke about attachment in previous podcasts, but things like that. You know, I, I've seen big, burly, <coughs> you know, rugby players in my therapy room that went to boarding school that, you know, maybe being traumatised is quite strong, but they, it definitely had an impact on the relationships. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you want to quote a book, it's a very old book called Separation of the Young by Margaret Marlow, and I think it was Peter Patterson, who talk about this very vividly, and there's very vivid photographs talking about uh, uh, before and after these attachment ruptures, and yeah. how that can carry psychological scars throughout life. Yeah, so if we've got a client that does regress and does go to the younger self, is that the time where we step into our nurturing parent? Well, that's what I think. I think I'll, I'll talk about nurturing parent in a minute, but I think that's where therapy is most effective. Exactly yeah. what you just said, <clears throat> because I think the early decisions we make about ourselves, a life, and the world are made from a, our younger self. So, if we can use the regression in that process we're talking about here, where the client goes to their younger self. That's when real therapy, I think, is most effective. So that's yeah. the first thing I want to say. So you would step into regression. Now, using a TA model, because that's what you did in terms of nurturing parent, the answer is yes to your answer. But it would be good to utilize the nurturing parent. Because usually, and I say usually, there's never a certainty in psychotherapy, but usually um, the deficit uh it's because the relational needs haven't been met yeah. or traumas have occurred and usually they need a different type of parenting yeah a more compassionate one or in ta let's use nurturing parent it's quite a good channel to go to yeah which you know if we talk about the ego states and everything else that transaction can go on for quite a while if they're in their child and we're in our parent ego state you know that, that transaction like i said can go backwards and forwards for a whole session yeah and it's not so much about so the people listening can put this in perspective so if we're talking about therapists using utilizing the nurture and parent in aid of parent, you know, uh, parenting, um, how can I explain, healing the, the deficit with yeah. the self, then we, we might be sort of doing things like giving permissions to the younger self that it's okay to be different. 
yeah or go okay to be you and the world you know yeah the world, the world won't collapse yeah it's okay for you to express feelings i'm still with you and yeah. those sorts of permissions <clears throat> from a, a different type of parent are incredibly useful in healing yeah and recognition and validation for for things as well you know and i know we've spoke about strokes in the past but giving positive strokes for you know what they're doing in the present yeah and the other area going into the nurturing part of this language is protection mm. and i think that the so-called parent let's put it in that job for the therapist is very very geared towards protection yeah so the younger child who's been traumatized or a relational needs haven't been met or there's been a rupture in the attachment system not only not only are they gonna you know have validating permissions but they will feel a protection you know i was so i'm a parent figure if you want to put it in those terms they probably never had before yeah to, you know, to enable themselves to express things which perhaps they've repressed for a very long time yeah i i agree protection and permission i think are, are two of the main things <clears throat> for me, um that i use in the therapy room yeah and uh, and so i think to think developmentally and a really good question for a therapist to ask themselves and then to ask the person that client what age do you, what age is this person presenting in front of me mm. and if they're not sure just ask them what yeah. age do you feel that yeah and if they say three then you have clues on in your let's use your model three to six you know uh what to do next yeah i i i love the developmental processes you know whichever one it is like you said about you know the individuation and separation and all those sorts of things i think they all kind of merge quite well together and there are a lot of tools available for the therapist to use in order to do this work mm. and i think that a lot of the trauma that people bring into the client room in the present has its etiology in the past yeah and what happens in regression is the client will go back like going through an onions of a in the layers of an onion will go back to where the first trauma was yeah so to think developmentally um is very important when we're dealing with the younger self yes which is like i said it's the foundation of, of everything i think in, in the work that i do you know because we do bring the, our past into the present so wherever we are in the moment it's our younger self that we're bringing even if it's 12 months ago or five years ago you know yeah. we can still be in adult but we're not in the here and now we're our past person right. i'm so ingrained over 35 years to think developmentally yeah i was trained that way i i work clinically for 36 years from this foundation i would be the world worst cbt therapist <laughs> bless your heart <laughs> no i would because I, I, I how can i not you know it'd be like going to an alien planet yeah i i don't i just i, I find it very hard to stop thinking of developmentally yeah because when you no. think of it, there's a door behind you, Bob, and I keep I keep imagining this thing of, of you know somebody walking in the therapy room, literally behind that door where you are. That you know, I would imagine the major. I don't want to make assumptions, but the majority of people when they walk in the therapy room door are not their self of today. Correct. They're usually younger. Yeah. And if you and if I take myself back to where well, I have to be thirty four. When I went in to see my first therapist, I was certainly was not 34. Yeah. And so that's the psychological age of a very different younger person. Yeah. You know, but even the 
the projection of the person we want people to think yeah. we are tends yeah. to fall yeah. away when we walk into the <clears throat> room. No, yeah. So it would be very, very, very difficult for me to ever be a, a CBT therapist. Now, that I don't want to discount or discredit CBT therapists because, you know, solution focused therapy has its place, you know, has its place. If you've, been yeah. trained, if you've been trained that way, it will be like the reverse, you know, it's yeah. like um, a, a different way of thinking. I'm just saying if for this podcast, in terms of developmental thinking, it's a different way of doing therapy. Yeah, yeah. And I, I agree. There is a time, you know, a time and a place for CBT. You know, we don't want to discount any other models. It's just, you know, for me, I can only talk about the one that I've been trained in because I don't know that much about the other stuff. So, yeah. Of course, it has a developed transaction analysis, which is a psychodynamic model, has at its heart a developmental perspective. Yeah. Now, that does not mean that it couldn't be used in short-term uh, focused outcome ways like CBT, if you want to look at it that way, because of its theory on contracts and uh, various other thoughts. But it has at its heart the ideas that we can move from different parts of ourselves. And then we have a younger self, which we always carry with us. Yeah. A really interesting podcast again, Bob. No, it's fascinating. Both of us were trained with this theory. And... Um, you know, it's the, I'm sure it's the way that both of us think. Yeah, yeah. And as you said earlier on, mine started when I was nursery nursing training, when I was in my 20s with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, you know, there was, the, we called it the pie system, physical, intellectual, emotional and social development, you know, oh, yeah. like the holistic side of things. Yeah. Oh, oh. No, I, I think it's, it's, it's um, really important, this stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. It's been another oh. wonderful podcast. So Thank what you. we're going to be talking about in the next one is working with metaphors in the therapy. Oh, again. And if you're talking about the younger self, this podcast is a must for you next week because one of the best ways to reach the younger self psychologically is through metaphor and symbolization. Yeah. I think it cuts through a lot of barriers using metaphors. Oh whatever age they're presenting yeah yeah, yeah absolutely okie dokie until next time bob speak yeah, soon see you then bye 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 you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode <laughs>